should be a. Uh... We're rolling anyone. Oh. Rolling okay. anyone. Uh, let, let's start. Because 40 over there is playing one of the one of the best of the 15 games we went through. Yep. <laughs> He's playing Valk Valkyrie Profile. Ooh. That's one of the that's yeah. one that we covered on the list. On the top fifteen. Oh yeah. Okay, so you are you know all the Super Nintendo classes, but do you remember all the console's most unappreciated games? Yes, I own a few. This year marks 25 years since the Super Nintendo was released in North America. Momentous occasion for video game fans growing up in the 90s. And even though the Big N has released four more consoles since, many Nintendo fans say, would say that NES is still the best that the House of Mario has ever released. The House I of would Mario. Say best. No, it's just one of the most one of the most memorable. I'll say that. Yeah. A lot of console success has to do with its roster games, of course, from third-party titles to Nintendo's own franchises. This was an era from 1990 to 96 that showcased the platform's total dominance over the industry. Even after Sega Genesis proved to be a strong competitor, and yeah, it does. And we all know who won the console arms race in the end. It's not difficult to see why. Just look at Nintendo's own IPs. It's easy to argue that Super Mario World... <clears throat> Super Metroid <clears throat> and Legend of Zelda Link to the Past are the very best games in their respective series. And that's not even counting <sighs> games made by outside studios such as Capcom and Konami when they actually were good. And that be Capcom and No, Konami. that's the, that that was before they turned to suits. Ah yes, there's a lot more. There's a lot more to this nest library than just Mario, Samus, and Link, and some of them are on my channel. <laughs> All right. More than two decades later, many other games okay. are still currently under. Okay, dirty buddy. I have something just for you. Is it a smoke bomb? In case if anyone does not know, Tony is playing a, a, a game. Valkyrie, so. he is. Valkyrie. I almost said Chronicles. I'm sorry. I mean Profile. These are the 25 most underrated games on the SNES. Ah, uh, yes. This one. Ah, uh, yes. We're, we're going into those days of $2.50 Friday, Fridays after school games. 25. Saturday Night Slam Masters. Oh yeah, that, that was that that was that was the shit right there. Wrestling games were extremely hit or miss in the eight bit and sixteen bit eras. It's arguable that the WWF, really the only name in professional wrestling in the U.S., didn't put out a single great game until the N64 era. That's fine though because it gave other companies like uh, the opportunity to innovate with. Much more creative, creative titles that focus on the overtop nature of sports entertainment. Saturday Night Slam Masters was one of those games playing more like a traditional fighter that ends up pinning your opponent than a wrestling game. The art, which was created by Fist of North Star artist Tetsuo Ha, almost made the game feel like a Street Fighter 2 wrestling game, which is not a bad thing at all. And it stars uh, Mike Hager from Final Fight. Yes, Mike Hager. Also, what most people don't know is that um, this game also spawned a sequel in the arcades. Which I also did on my channel. There was a Slam Masters 2 and there was a Slam Masters 3. So there, the other two games were never released. They, they stayed on arcade. Which is a damn shame. Uh, twenty-four. Oh, it's on my, it's on my, my let's play list. Ogre Battle: The March of the Black Queen. Ogre Battle is possibly the greatest unfinished saga in gaming. Yeah, it really is. The very first game appeared on 
the very first game in the series appeared on the SNES and began with a tarot card reading that determined your fitness for leading a revolution against an evil empire. And what a re revolution it is, as you spend dozens of hours recruiting and building an army of soldiers, witches, and even griffins in a strategy game that still feels incredibly deep more than 20 years later. The SNES version is one of the rarer titles on this console, but has since been released re-release on the Wii Virtual Console. That's also a quality PlayStation port that's slightly cheaper, but still the one of the higher price games on that system. Regardless of which version you play, this is a strategy this is a game that, that all strategy and RPG fans need to experience at least once. I never played a game. I never heard Ogre Battle until later. I've read it the game. I've actually ran the game myself, so that's like one of those two dollar fifty games every Friday, Saturday, every weekend, every Friday, Saturday. I will rent at least one game from Super Nintendo and one game for for Sega Genesis until they went up to PlayStation. Then I went up to PlayStation. Twenty three, Tetris Attack, A.K.A. Pedro de Pong. Yeah. Nintendo seems content to re-release a barely updated version of Dr. Mario for years. <laughs> but has completely ignored its best puzzle best puzzle game of the 90s. I, no, I don't own that. I, I, I forgot I don't own that. Ran it again. <laughs> don't mind the Tetris in the title. This is completely new puzzle game where you match color blocks as they rise from the bottom of the screen. In an effort to keep them from reaching the top, it's all wrapped around a story involving Yoshi and Bowser, which is fine. But the real star here is the ultra-competitive two-player mode. It's a real shame that Nintendo has, hasn't has yet released an HD version of this game with m online multiplayer. Oh, no. Fuck that. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Because, oh, no. Imagine if, um, imagine if they had all them extra perks on them, like Turbo oh, Ultra. God. Oh, you want to play it on online? Guess what? Fuck that shit. Yeah. I mean, they did it with the uh, Puzzle Fighter. Ugh. I got it. For the B60. It's and that was uh, one Ugh. of the achievements Ugh. that you had to play mm. with yeah. all four people mm. online. Also, the soundtrack to the game is good. Yeah, it's second best to say Super Mario Super Mario RPG. Yeah. Let's see, twenty two. Booger man. You. Because Mario and Sonic were such massive successes in the nineties, virtually every other publisher assumed they too needed a mascot to put them on the map. This led to some unusual creations. Most of those were thankfully I've forgotten. Boogerman is one of those characters that are maybe better left in the 90s. They're going to make a kickstart today. Oh, good lord, no. Yeah, but it's a failure. It's a failure, oh, of course. But he actually started in a pretty cool game. It has some of the better graphics and music of any platformer from the era, and while the ability to burp and fart on your enemies is completely sophomoric, it still er it still entertains adult me almost as much as ten year old me. Okay. And and I'm interested yeah, in the yeah, fact of the character. Yeah. Boogerman was in I think was in Clay Fighters. Uh huh. He was. With a burn champ. Okay, so we got. Oh, 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 okay. Number 21. Goof Troop. Oh, yeah, 40 already did that game. Goof yeah. Troop was a, for, a fairly forgettable Disney cartoon starring Mickey Mouse's talking dog pal, but at least it gave us a surprisingly good Super Nintendo game. This was a time period when Capcom could do no wrong, and the company put Shinji Mikami, who would later go on to direct much of the Resident Evil series, in charge of Goof Troop. Sadly, there's no zombies or Zor. That's zombies or gore. Zombies or Zor. What the fuck? <laughs> Go ahead. It depends uh, if it's the original 
The original. Sweet. We're talking about the original. Yeah, because going from four, five, and six, and spice. It went. It, it just basically be- went to the arcade. Ver- it just basically went like um from from survival horror to, to action adventure. Um, yeah, and now they basically and they're trying to go back. It. They're trying to go back. Yeah. In charge of. But with with, with a first person view. Mm-hmm. Sadly, there are no zombies or gore, but there are surprisingly some strong survival elements, like having to defeat enemies with objects in the level rather than facing them head on. If you ever wanted to see where the where some very early Resident Evil ideas got this got their start, this is the game to check out. Yeah, that's 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 true. That's true. Twenty Weapon Lord. I've seen this on. Uh, I've seen on one of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Weapon Lord is a definitive example of a game ahead of its time. While accessible games like Mortal Kombat Street Fighter ruled the roost of the mid '90s. Yes, 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 get away. Um, the team of virtual visual visual concepts set out to re. Okay, mm-hmm. we'll be there soon. We'll be there soon. Yeah, no problem. One sec. Okay. Um. Weapon Lord, uh, yeah. While Weapon Lord featured uh, only a few characters, they had tons of special moves and death combos that put many of Mortal Kombat's fatalities to shame. And which characters you killed during the story mode actually had an impact on the ending. Despite these innovations, reviews were largely negative at the time of release. Still, the reputation has improved quite a bit in recent years. Publisher Namco even used many of Weapon Lord's ideas in his Soul Edge and Soul Calibur games. By using weapons to fight. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, this one. Phalanx. I heard that's one. With, with the worst box art that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I know, it doesn't. Phalanx m- might take the prize for the worst box art on the SNES. Despite being a 2D shooter, it featured a bearded old man playing a banjo on the cover for some reason. Yeah, that's why I didn't understand. Again, again, doesn't make any sense. There's a spaceship too, but most of the focus is on the old guy. Maybe there was a mix-up in the art department and they didn't have time to fix it. It's not really clear what happened. Anyway, those who got past the box art actually found a surprisingly fun shooter. You could control the the spaceship. The speed of your ship, store multiple weapons simultaneously, and even sacrifice these weapons for smart bombs. Not the deepest game on the SNES, but it's one of the most enjoyable in brief spurts. Really, number and 18. The, and the, the, the box art was in the, the top 25 worst box art in... I don't blame him. Yeah, anyway, be okay, no, because... Don't care about yeah. what he likes, but still, don't blame him. A two. Indiana Jones: Greatest Adventures. When I when I actually plan to do, I plan to do a Lego version. Lucas Art Super Star Wars <laughs> still get a lot of love, but it's my own Indiana Jones game on the SNES is arguably superior. The game takes you through all in three indie movies. Let's never speak of the fourth one. Yes, as you take out the baddies with Indy's iconic bullwhip. While primarily a platformer, there are also those a few levels featuring flying a minecart and even ramp traveling down a mountain. Sadly, there are, there have only been a handful of Indiana Jones games released over the years. This is one this one is easily one of the best. Um, seventeen. Yeah. Uh, don't mention the. Yeah. Right. Don't mention the. The point and click adventure games. Mm. Uh, number 17, I've seen Mag do this. Uniracers. Have you never heard of DMA design? There was a small Scottish developer that went on to develop a little series known as Grand Theft Auto. Uniracers have pretty much nothing to do with GTA. There are no open worlds, small bosses, or murders. It's just relatively simple, friendly, family incredibly fun game about racing in cycles and pulling off tricks with them. Certainly no one would object to Nintendo resurrecting the series or Rockstar including homage to it in the next GTA. 
Ah, uh, yes. Konami, when you actually pulled off some good hits. 16, The Adventures of Batman Robin, not the Genesis version. The animated series. Yeah, Batman the Animated Series stands up as one of the greatest cartoons of all time. Yes, it is. And the SNES game, based on the show, is a rare 90s licensed game to do its source material justice. The graphics sound and are outstanding for their time. This is a game that almost looks and sounds like the cartoon, which is almost unheard of back then. All the major villains from the series are included as bosses, and all you need and all you need to use a variety of bat gadgets to take them out. The Batmobile stages are a little hard to control, but they're but they're worth putting up with because everything is of such high quality. Ah, number fifteen. Yes, I've read this game, and I then I would like <laughs> to put this and I would like to put this on my let's play and list. Is, I think this is what we you did. He did. He, he, he did the first one, which. Which, strangely enough, chronologically, this is the first game. This is the first game in the series. Then um, Fortress of Doom is the second. But, you know, you look at from this end, it's like release date. But chronologically, this is the first game. Lufia 2 Rise of the Centrals. In which, when I, when I do it, it's just going to be called Lufia Rise of the Centrals. Particularly in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of great games took longer than expected to develop that's because back then there's something called quality we don't have that in this day and age say metroid federation force <clears throat> yes i i did i did do that <laughs> <laughs> i took a shot i don't care a lot of great games took longer than ex expected to develop release just as a new generation of consoles was on the horizon. And then we were completely forgotten until they rediscovered by the nostalgic fans years later. Lufia 2 is one such game. Bidding on a good but not great RPG released on released earlier in the SNES life cycle. Lufia 2 featured deeper puzzles and gameplay mixed with some, with some of the best music on the console. Lufia 2 is... It's easily one of the best RPGs of the 90s that Square had nothing to do with. And, it was, and it's made by the same people who made Pocky and Rocky. Boo. And Pocky and Rocky. Not Sumer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Otherwise known in otherwise known in, J in Japan is Estopolis. For those who are wondering. Ah, oh, oh, yes. This kid. Yes, I've done this on my channel, and this was part of my two dollar fifty renty time during high school. Number fourteen, Wanderers from East or East Three. Ah, uh, yes, Nihon Falcom. I still got to do East Five and Six. I don't have PSP, so I don't. I'm not going to do seven. Despite eight main entries released to date and a broken and a surprising number of remakes, the Ease action RPG series hasn't really broken into mainstream gaming until state. While the other while the earlier games in the series were strictly top down similar to Legend of Zelda in many ways, East 3 was a more traditional side scroller. Because of this, it's often viewed as the dark sheep of the series. But as ignoring a surprisingly fun and epic game that can stand on its own as one of the better platformers on the console. Yes, that is true. Yeah, and uh East is kind of a little hard but if it, you don't know if you don't know what you're doing yeah because I, I have uh, played it on the Wii Virtual Console oh my god the boss is all so freaking hard well which version were you playing you were playing the original or the um the DS remake uh the original oh the, yeah the console well, you know what that means. You've seen me play Mask of the Sun. You have to flank. That's the that's the whole trick. You can't take them on. I mean, I mean, I was at the final area. Oh but... goodness! I know what I know what you, that's that's what I'm telling you. Um, you in that game, if you're playing it like the classic version, in which you just basically have to move around, you have to flank and or you have to. That's basically how you have to attack. You have to flank and and or attack from behind but since that game is like oh 
No. Yeah. 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 I've, I've, like I said, Mask of the Sun. That, that's firsthand how I know how, that's how I know. Trying to run around, trying to save your ass. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, yes. Another one of my games that I actually own. And is it a future LP? No, I've already done it on my channel. Oh, yeah, that's right. Legend of the Mystical Ninja. Also, I also have the anime. There was an anime. There was an anime? There was an anime. Called, I never knew that. Yeah, there was an anime called The Legend of Mystical Ninja. So... I mean, I, I already know... Oh, yeah, Konami the, did... Konami version. did... Konami did a few titles that actually went to anime. Mystical Ninja, Twin B, and Tokimeki Memorial. Easier. Probably will watch that pretty soon. Goemon or Mystical Ninja is an absolutely <laughs> hilarious and brilliant action RPG that is sadly deep, ro deeply rooted in medieval Japanese culture. That Konami has never quite figured it out. Oh, there's also a GBA remake of it too. And um, it never quite figured out how to market it in the West. The Legend of the Mystical Ninja was the very first game in the series that was released in North America. And it's almost pitch perfect beat em up humor with beat em up with strong RPG elements. Much of the series trademark humor translate fairly well in the game, even though in why you call going on a BC Mario kicking and Dr. Yang is beyond me. Um I am very uh, yet yet everybody yeah everybody else, Yae and Sasuke. I'm like oh, oh you left them like that. Yet you wanna never mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, much of the series trademark f translated fairly well in the future, and it has a wonderful soundtrack inspired by traditional Japanese music. Sadly, Konami seems to have lost interest in the in the series in recent years. That's where and, we come and in. like I said, the last uh mythical ninja game they did was in in the sixty four. Yeah, mystical ninja sixty four. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is another one. Damn, they're really they're really playing on what I own. This is another game that I used to own and was a two fifty borrower in the back in the day. Rock Command Soccer or Mega Man Soccer. Long before Mario made a name in the world of sports, Capcom tried to expand the Mega Man franchise with this bizarre soccer game. And strangely, soccer is actually one of the sports I'm actually good at on video games. Um. The <laughs> The gameplay is fairly standard for its time with the addition of the special attacks used by the robots in the main series of games. Somehow, this canon, to, canon to, that takes place after Mega Man 4. In this game, Rock and Blues decide that, that the best way to stop so the best way to stop Dr. Wily is a soccer match. While hardly the greatest game in the illustrious Mega Man series, or even the best game, or the best soccer game on SNES. Its graphics and its soundtrack hold up pretty well, and nothing else. It's worth checking out for a novelty of it. And, and I found out, uh, I was uh, watching Cornshack trail of this game. He uh, found a glitch. Of course there's a glitch to it. I've seen it too. It's like, it's like a, what, the, where you keep the pony in the corner? Yes, I know about that glitch. Ooh. I know about the clutch because I, I've done, like I said, I'm good at soccer games sometimes, and sometimes I can find out strange glitches with them. Two fifty um, rented, two fifty borrower, Jurassic Park. The Jurassic Park movies have inspired some of the surprisingly good games over the years, beginning with the first, the very first title released on the SNES to coincide with the original movie. Yes, you play as Dr. Alan Grant. And you fight dinosaurs with a bunch of weapons from a top-down perspective, which was terribly innovative for its time. But this is much a th this is actually a much more thoughtful adaptation of the film than you would first expect. You commit you can communicate via radio with other characters from the film, and some will purposely try to impede your progress with bad advice. And when you head indoors, the game shifts to a first-person view as you collect ID cards. This is so much better than a typical mu movie cash in that flooded the SNES library in the mid nights. <coughs> <coughs> no. <coughs> 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 
Demolition Man. <clears throat> Ten. Ah, oh, yes, I've rented this too. Cybernator. Yes, I've rented this too when I did a Let's Play on it. Fuck you, Konami. <clears throat> <laughs> Cybernator proves yet again that there are a few things more cathartic than manning a giant mech and shooting the hell out of the mechs and robots. Developers at NCS Corp seem to take real joy in taking this generic concept and pushing it to its full potential with tight controls, vibrant graphics, and even surprisingly strong soundtrack. Cybernator remains somewhat obscure even today, but it's well worth picking up if you run a across a cartridge in the wild. And yeah, so I played it, and it's done by Konami. Um, also, in Japanese, it's called Assault Suits Vulcan. Well, yeah, Assault Suits Vulcan. Um, number nine, Metal Warriors. And if you love Cybernator, I've got great news for you, because Metal Warriors is basically an unofficial sequel. Well, developed by a completely different company. LucasArts. Metal Wars doubled down on everything that made Cybernator great, with more mechs, faster gameplay, and better graphics. The game even featured the ability to exit your mech to get through certain areas. <coughs> that was basically a <clears throat> front mission gun hazard. <clears throat> Just saying. Even uh, yes, yes, yes. some fans argue that Cybernator is a superior game, but Metal Warriors tweaked what made that game great just enough to edge out it, its unofficial predecessor. Total Card I mean, Smash TV! Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Super Smash TV. Done it on my channel as a vlog. Uh, I don't know why I did it. <coughs> Basically... You need to do something. Yes, I did, I did. I was that bored. Basically, a twin-stick shooter before consoles came along with analog sticks. Super Smash TV featured incredibly fast and intense gameplay, and I basically cheated the fuck out of that game. This nearly perfect, this nearly perfect part of the arcade game lets one or two players blow steam by firing weapons or, and hundreds of enemies attacking them from all sides. That's a futuristic life or death TV show, The Running Man. No. <clears throat> yeah, The Running Man. Well, the 1990 setting seemed futuristic at the time. <clears throat> Running Man. <clears throat> Uh, a game I've never heard of, but I think i never heard of. Blackthorn. It was never in my area, so I never heard of it. Before Blizzard built mega huge franchises like StarCraft, Warcraft, Diablo, there was simply Blackthorn. But even back in 1994, Blizzard seemed poised for greatness. What could have any? What could have been another ge generic 16-bit shooter was actually a much deeper game, which required you to search for keys in its giant, vibrant levels to pro to progress. If you never played the SNES version of Blackthorn, it Blackthorn is a f if you let me read that. Even if you never played the SNES version, Blackthorn is a free download on Battle.net now. So there's no there's not a reason to play now. Oh, you can use the wand. Yeah, that's to right. Blackthorn. Yeah. No listening. You kind of missed out on your game, Forty. Goof Troop. <laughs> uh, he missed out on Goof Troop. But he missed out on zombies. Zombies! Ate my neighbors. Back in the day, LucasArts was actually known for a lot more than cranking out Star Wars and dysfunctional development cycles. The developer used to make uh, really innovative games like Zombies Ate My Neighbors, top-down shooter with tons of weapons, ranging from water guns to bazookas, and it had real personality too. Zombies contain nods to numerous classic horror movies, and despite the titles, monsters including enemies like squid men, blobs, and even demon babies. Satan babies? Demon babies. This is also one of the more difficult games of the 16-bit era, but it's well worth experiencing just for the creativity on display here. And I think if you save all the people in each level, you probably might get a real good ending. Uh, of course. If you're that good. Uh, hello, 250. I've already beaten you on Let's Play. Act Razor. Few games have ever pulled off the merging of two completely disparate gen 
genres into one like Act Rage or Dick. Yeah, so much of the game is a solid, though not especially memorable, platformer. But those sections are squeezed between a really interesting city building section where you play, where you basically play God. In fact, you refer to as God in the Japanese version. I actually have the Japanese version. In, in it translated. Even though it seems like two gameplay styles should have nothing to do with each other, it works remarkably well here. Act Razor is one of the finest, most memorable games on the SNES, and its sequel is not worth checking out. I said it. Guys, it's terrible. It's terrible. The, 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 the first game is great, but the second one, most people didn't like it because the 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 sim aspect was taken out. I did yeah, like the sim I, aspect. I've seen, I've seen Newbie did both games, I think. I only did the first game. But, you know, nobody didn't give a fuck, so I'm, I just did anyway. Then most times people don't give a fuck of what, what, what I do. <laughs> okay. Okay, we, what we got? What we got? Oh, Shadowrun. Ah, uh, this one. Yeah, yeah it's the same game that this is crap did. Well, there, th well, this game is okay. This game is alright. It was based off a card game, I think. Um, or a, it was either paper, pen, paper, or something like that. So that's okay. Yeah. Um, Shadowrun. There's no shortage of traditional sword and sorcery RPGs on the SNES, so Shadowrun stands out specifically for its dark cyberpunk setting. While, re while receiving mixed reviews upon release, Shadowrun's image has been rehabilitated in recent years, with many players praising its deep conversation system and gameplay that makes its traditional tabletop with 16-bit RPG. Plus, the film, noir, film noir's influences help give it what quite possibly the best storyline of any SNES game. And, uh, I think there's a, a chance of both versions up there. There was, there was. There was a chance version. And version. there was a... And it's on Steam. Now. Remake. On Steam. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not into pa pen and paper. So, there you go. Ah, uh, yeah, so, something I actually own. <laughs> it, it's actually in my um, collection. I can't remember how I got it. And I think we played this. Yeah, he did. He he streamed it. He streamed yeah. it and played it, so, yeah. Ah, uh, yes, number three. That, it, it is part of a series. This is the, this is, um, the second of the series. For those who don't know, um, Illusion of Guy is the second of the series. It is it, the first is Soul Blazer or Soul Blader. The second is Illusion of Gaia, and the third is Terra Enigma. So this is the second of the series. Illusion of Gaia is an action RPG for gamers who want something different from their action RPGs. While combat remains relatively simple, there aren't so many new ideas that work surprisingly well like an experience system that de-emphasize grinding and a simplified item system. Those might sound like bad ideas at first, but they work surprisingly well in the context of the game. Wrapped in some truly ingenious puzzles, yes, those, those puzzles are really good, and one of the best stories of the 16-bit era, you'll wonder why more games haven't tried to copy Illusion of Gaia's innovations. It's the best of its time, that's why. Number two, a game that I've tried but never really got into. Secret of Evermore. Square released so many great SNES games in the 90s that at least one of them had to fall through the cracks. Secret of Evermore is, a, is unique among Square's titles and as the only game ever released by the company that was designed by Americans. This meant a more westernized art style and a focus on American tropes of American uh, of traditional tropes of American storytelling, like the adventure of a boy and his dog. But you can also see a lot of the Square influence at play here too, with combat extremely similar to Secret of Mana, though the two titles are officially unrelated. Evermore may never quite meet the heights of Mana, but it's still worth tra tracking down to see how a Square game would turn out with with a stronger Western influence. Again, I never played the game, 
Actually, I, I have played a game, but I never really got into the game. It, yeah, it was I never it, it was that, it was it was that foreign to me. Yeah, I'm an American, but I play an American game. <gasps> I'm foreign too. Moving on, and the number one game that I can't believe I'm still reading that is actually number one on the list. Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon, in which I still remember was a boss in Kokoron. There was a boss called Harvest Moon. I read her mm -hmm. truck. Yeah. It's like, oh, hey, I had to beat Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon as a boss before it became a game. Go figure. On paper, Harvest Moon sounds like the worst game ever. You inherit a farm, you grow crops, and take care of livestock. If you're particularly successful, you get married too. But anyone who has played a Harvest Moon game knows that this sounds about as exciting as watching paint dry. It's actually incredibly addicting watching your farm grow. While later games in the series include much more customization, the SNES... A wonderful original, life. <coughs> yeah. Yes, a wonderful life. The SNES original is one of the most relaxing games around and well worth a playthrough for anyone looking for something a little bit simpler than saving the world. Oh yeah! It's called Farmville. Or in case that I'm Or playing, Cityville. I'm, I'm playing like a, 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 I'm sorry to say this, but I play a, a game on my tablet called Heyday. It's basically like a Farmville, but it's so, a good so, game. So, so. I love it. But uh, anyway, these are the top fifty, the top twenty-five games. Yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm still a gasp at um, number one being Harvest Moon, but uh, I, ain't, I ain't complaining because you will never oh, see me play that on my channel. It, it's probably for people who just want to be relaxed. Yeah, well, I have plenty of games that I, that make me want to relax too. If I want to play a puzzle game, I, oh, I could pull out something like a jigsaw puzzle. I could pull out a jigsaw puzzle. Like, oh, hey. Jigsaw puzzle. I do have I mean, a few jigsaw puzzles. On, I well, mean, only, there are some things that makes me relax, which is Animal Crossing, Pokemon, just because I'm shy hunting, mm. puzzle game, oh. card games, uh, and um, simulation at Sims. Uh huh. So don't mind. I made I made one on game dev similar called uh, game dev tycoon called Sim Internet. <laughs> <laughs> when you're when you really want to see how the internet is made, make a sim call uh, make a sim game called Sim I I Internet. There you go. <laughs> anyway, those were the top twenty five. What is yours? What is, what is on this list that you consider when you're one of the most criminally uh, underrated uh, games you ever if played? There's any other underrated. Oh, Super Nintendo games. Oh, trust me, there are plenty. Did not make it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Let us know in the comments, please. You can either... You, like the video, like comment, the video, subscribe, subscribe, whatever. <laughs> we'll see you next time with even more weirdness on this channel. I've been... I've been just... Let me catch myself. I've been the Tank Aisha of gaming, and I'm still Dr. Blackjack at the same time, and yeah. And yeah, um, yeah, we're done. Bye. Bye. <laughs>